Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Simon T. Bailey, welcome to the conversation today. So good to be with you. Thank you for having me. It is great to be with you. You're joining us from Chicago. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about discovering your purpose through resilience and leadership. You know, leadership is often a thankless gig. Um, I was actually just having a conversation this morning uh, with, with someone who was kind of frustrated, you know, kind of blue this morning because of the challenges they were facing. And, and the reality is, yeah, often leadership really is just a thankless job. It's hard. You're bearing a lot of weight. People are coming at you um, all the time with their problems, with their challenges. You're trying to put out fires. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, people are upset at you and, and you're just doing the best you can. And, it, you know, it's, it's all about resilience. It's all about um, just staying with it and, you know, the, the falling down and getting back up and all of those sorts of things, all those cliches, right? It's all about all of that. Um, and leadership is hard, right? Um, and that's why I think it's just so important that we always know our why, that we always have a clear purpose and fostering that resilience within ourselves um, is really what's going to make us a great leader. Uh, so we're going to unpack all of this and talk about how that can help lead to our purpose as we have this conversation today. As we get started, I wanted to share Simon's bio with everybody. Simon T. Bailey is the world's leading expert in brilliance. His groundbreaking research, State of Working America Report, Thriving in Resilience and Brilliance, solidifies his insights in his 11th book, Resilience at Work, How to Coach Yourself into a Thriving Future. With Disney Institute as his launchpad, he's left an incredible mark on 2,400 plus organizations in 54 countries, including American Express, Deloitte, Visa, uh, Signet Jewelers, and Taco Bell. He has made a remarkable impact on over 120,000 professionals who've experienced his pioneering courses on the LinkedIn Learning Platform. He's also been recognized as Success Magazine's Top 25 alongside Brene Brown, Tony Robbins, and Oprah Winfrey, as well as being on Leader Hum's Top 200 power list. His viral video released on Goldcast through Meta has over 91 million plus views to date. Uh, I could go on. There's just so many awesome things about you and your background, Simon, but I'm going to pause there. Anything you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we launch on into the conversation? The one thing, John, that I've learned is that real leadership is not about motivating or trying to engage people to do more. Real leadership is about inviting people on a journey to discover the leader within themselves while they're mm -hmm. following you. So a, a leader can never take people to a place that they have not been themselves. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, so we often talk, you know, people often are, are talking about how to motivate others, how to, how to, you know, lead the horse to the, to the, um, to the trough, right? Or to, to go get the water. What you're saying is we can't actually motivate anybody. We can't actually lead someone to the water if they don't want to go or if they haven't ever been there themselves. Uh, and I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, we can't ever motivate somebody. All we can do is help them on the journey towards self-discovery, towards, you know, where they can learn and uncover their own motivations. And then we can create an environment where they can have that self-motivation and where they can unlock their own key core motivations themselves. And, and that's what a leader does that a leader creates that environment, a, cre a leader creates, um, those kind of experiences, um, where, where those things can be unlocked, where those things can be experienced, where people can come together and, and then the synergies and, and the collaborations can happen, uh, that can really create really cool things. Right. Absolutely. And when a person knows that a leader gets them and cares about them, that person goes the extra step uh, because they know that leader is about them and not just themselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, as we get started, I would love 
if we could start by just unpacking a little bit of your research state of working America, thriving in resilience and brilliance. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Um, th this comes out in your resilience at work uh, book. Uh, what, what are some of these core findings? 55% of working Americans would rather take a lower paying job to work for a leader that inspired their brilliance instead of one that doesn't. 74% uh, of working Americans would prefer to work for a leader who had no advanced degrees instead of a leader that had formal education. And what we begin to discover in the research, John, is that people want to work in an environment and for a leader where they are celebrated rather than tolerated. And what that simply means, and I'll use myself as an example. So I was working at Disney, John, and I was a jerk of a boss. I was way over my skis. I was a, a boss with an agenda instead of a leader with a vision. And if the truth be told, Disney was about to invite me to find my happiness elsewhere because I had a need to control, a need to be right. And I was in my own way, had no self-awareness, had a lot of ego edging goodness out. And what I began to discover after organizational development did an intervention, and they took me through the tried and true start, stop, and continue, what they said is you manage up really well, but you don't care about your folks, and they know it. And so for almost 18 months, once a month, I had to go to Disney University to understand what it really meant to be a leader in the culture at that particular time. And three takeaways. Number one, if I don't look myself in the mirror and admit that I don't know what I don't know, then mm -hmm. he's going to bounce me, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Number two, and I got this from one of my mentors, John Maxwell, is that consistency compounds over time. So consistent action behavior in the right direction, you're not phoning it in. People know that you are doing the work of leadership. They start to believe you and trust you. But then the third thing is always coming back to these two questions. Why you? Why now? Why should people follow you? Why right now? Because everybody is making a bet on you, on their career, on the organization. What is bet? Brilliance, energy, time. And sometimes they're going to hedge their bet if they think this leader is not really up to leading in the right way. But when they find a leader that gets it, oh my goodness, that's the unlock. People will go the extra step because they're like, okay, this is the one. This this leader has found their inner Neo in the matrix and I want to follow. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I like that. And and you're right. I mean, your experience at Disney, that's not an uncommon experience. I think especially for a lot of young, inexperienced leaders, oftentimes they're thrust into those roles. They don't know any better. They don't know how to lead. They've been they've been successful in their careers up to that point. Uh, for di totally different reasons. Like uh, they've been successful in sales or they've been successful in whatever functional role they've been in. Now they're thrust into a leadership role. They're expected to manage a team. They have no idea what they're doing. And, and you know, all they can really do is try to mimic maybe what they've seen other people do, what they've seen on TV or in movies. Um and and oftentimes that's not particularly healthy, you know, or productive. And and it's no wonder. Like like a lot of people just don't have have the skill set. They just don't know what to do. And so you end up having a lot of people in in those early stages in their career that do what you did. Um and and it's, you know, I, I have a lot of sympathy for that. Um, not that I want to have a lot of bad bosses out there, but I do have sympathy when people just don't know any better. Uh, and so, you know, kudos to you for for going through the work, you know, of of trying to learn and grow and and figure out what um you didn't know. And and to, you know, that's hard. That's hard to go through that self-reflection to admit you know, uh, what you were doing wrong and to admit, you know, where there were gaps and, and all of that, that's painful, <laughs> especially, you know, it's, it's painful to the ego. It's painful, you know, to, to, to know that maybe you were causing some harm, uh, to your people. Um, but, but one of the key insights that you shared in that story that I think is really important to drill down on is, is the care piece, 
Like yes. it's, it's, it's great to be able to lead up. We need to be able to lead up, down, across, like there's different kinds of leadership that, and all of those are important. But when we're talking about leading a team, we need to show that we care. Like they need to believe it. They need to know that we sincerely care about their growth and development. Um, not, not that we can motivate them. Like we, I cannot get people to do what they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, I suppose I can like, you know, figuratively hold a gun to their head with like carrots and sticks and like threats of firing them and whatever. Like there, there are those types of things um, where I can like in the short term, get someone to do something out of fear. But, but overall, like in the long term, I can't really get anyone to do anything um, unless I'm setting the stage for them to, to find the motivation within themselves. And that's going to be really hard to do if they don't feel like I genuinely care about them and that I, I genuinely want them to be successful and that I genuinely want them to develop and grow and be prepared for the next stage in their career. Those are all pretty basic human desires and needs um, mm -hmm. that anyone wants in any relationship, uh, you know, whether it's a workplace relationship or a personal relationship or whatever. And so it's all built upon trust and you can't have that trust if if there's no like genuine sense of, of care. Right. Um, and so again, kudos to you for, for discovering that, for figuring that out, through, for going through the work of, of, uh, developing your skill set and your competencies, uh, around a uh, leadership and just a call out to that for anyone listening. If you find yourself in that same boat, like where, you know, you find yourself in over your head a little bit, you, you find yourself, um, you know, despite your best intentions of, you know, maybe falling a little bit short, that's okay. Like that's normal. I think everyone finds themselves in that boat from time to time. Um, and what matters more is that you're willing to do the work that you're willing to try and that you're willing to continue to press forward. That's really what resilience and leadership is all about. Um, if we all just knew all the answers, if we all just were perfect, one, that would be kind of boring, <laughs> you know, a world where everyone was just perfect all the time. Um, I don't want to live in that world. Um, but two, uh, you know, we're human. Like, that's just not reality. Like, that's never going to be the way it is. Um, and and so, you know, just set that aside. Like, that's you don't need to feel bad about being imperfect. Um, what What you need to do is just recognize that, yes, mistakes will happen always. They will happen. It's not a problem that they will happen. What, what's a problem is if you're unwilling to acknowledge them when they happen, if you're unwilling to grow from, you know, the things that you're learning about, right? Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that our research really showed us as it relates to this concept of brilliance and resilience, here's, here's the visual. In business, you get, it's like surfing in the ocean. You get knocked off your surfboard because of uncertainty, everything happened in the economy. Your resilience gets you back on the surfboard, but it's your brilliance that allows you to catch the next wave. So we ask working Americans, how do they define brilliance? Which is just another way, John, of saying purpose. And working Americans told us that brilliance is creativity, confidence, and wait for it, intelligence. So in other words, when people are in a caring environment and that leader cares about them as a human being, individuals actually practice AI, actual mm. intelligence. <laughs> they show up and go above and beyond because they have confidence in the resilient leader who understands who they are as a person. Now, how do you get there? It really comes down to have to versus want to. Do I have to lead or do I want to lead? And people know the distinction every single day. They're going through the file system, through the data in their mind to say, are they doing this because they have to do it or are they doing it because they want to do it? And that wanting to do it leader has made that emotional commitment to do three things, John. Number one, commit to coach, realize their attitude is key. And number three, how can I create an impact for this person because it's not about me, it's about we. Yeah, I like that. When you first started to say that, my mind went to a slightly different place. Uh -huh. um, you know, the the 
the reluctant leader, I actually really like, um, it's a different type of reluctant leader than I think what you were describing. So in my mind, I, I, I'm, I really admire the quote unquote reluctant leader, the person, it's not about them. It's not the arrogance. It's not the ego. Um, you know, they would be more than happy to be behind the scenes, supporting other people. Um, you know, those are, those are the types of people I, I love it when they find themselves in leadership roles because it really isn't about them. Um, it, it's just about them helping other people, but actually I think that's exactly what you're describing. Totally. <laughs> um, totally. It, you know, and it's, it's not about the, the person who, who's like campaigning for the position They're you know, they're, they're trying to like play the political games to try to maneuver themselves to get into the role, not because they, you know, are trying to help others or care about other people or, you know, whatever. It's just all about climbing that rung of the ladder so they can get to the next rung to the next rung. Um, you know, so someone who cares about the role, who wants to be in the role for those reasons, that's the kind of person that I'm not so interested in and as having as a leader, but I really like the person that, you know, may not really care about the position. Otherwise they, they might be the reluctant leader. Um, but they, once they're in, they're invested. Once they're in, they're going to put their whole heart and soul into it because they know that, that what they're doing matters and that other people are relying on them and that they, their job is to help support um, those on their team. Like their job is to help lift up everyone that's working with them, right? Uh, like a, ri a rising tide lifts all ships and their job is to be that rising tide. I would be so bold to say, if you look at the reluctant leader, they probably have had more people be promoted out of their department into other areas of an organization, right. number one. Number two, they probably have higher customer satisfaction scores uh, just because leaders create the experience for employees, employees create the experience for customers. But then number three, if you look at their financial performance inside an organization, their KPIs, all of the things that we know, that reluctant leader who has their head down to say, how do we do it right? And how do I empower people to go and do it? They make things happen. And there might be some correlation in how we think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So all of this, I think, as we talk about this resilience, as we talk about, you know, the leader who's willing, you know, recognizing sometimes it's a lonely, it's a lonely road. It's, it's a thankless road. Uh, it's, it's a heavy weight to carry the burden of leadership. Um, all of this is true. Right. Um, and, and so having resilience as a leader is, is very, very vital. I would say that's always the case, but especially like during the pandemic, I think we saw this as keenly as any time, uh, because, you know, everyone was dealing with mental health challenges, social isolation, all of that, but it was really put upon leaders to look out for their teams and look out for everyone else, but who is looking out for the leader, right? Um, so it was just extra hard. It was extra challenging. Um, how, how does all of that then, if, if I'm someone, you know, who's in a leadership role, uh, I'm, I'm trying to practice resilience. How, how can that help me discover and lean into my purpose? Wow. Well, the first thing is being intentional about self-reflection. Self-reflection is something that I learned from Harry Kramer, former chairman and CEO of Baxter Healthcare. I was interviewing him uh, for a client virtually, and I said, Harry, in your 40-year career, what is the one thing that has allowed you to tap into your purpose? And he said, Simon, I ask myself three questions every single night before my head hits the pillow. Question number one, how did I make a difference today? Question number two, how did I grow? And then question number three, how do I add value or make a difference tomorrow? And I said, Harry, you do it every day. He said, every day, because he said that self-reflection keeps my feet on the ground, keeps me in touch with what's really going on. And it's that self-assessment without the board, without the other C-suite executives weighing in that allows him to say, okay, here's, here's my true north. Here's kind of what's going on. So those listening to us, I think, John, if they will have a self reflection practice come up mm. with those questions but take it a step further just don't jot it down perhaps on your smartphone write it down the power of therapeutic writing it down you stepping back looking at 
what did I just write? It's that hand to heart connection that allows you to truly know where you are. Yeah, I love that. The self-reflective piece, I think, is always powerful. It's always important in a lot of different facets of our life. <laughs> but <laughs> but I think particularly when you're wrestling um, with, with uh, leadership roles and, and leadership practice and learning and growing as a leader, uh, practicing regular self-reflective practices, um, uh, various mechanisms, um, keeping a journal, journaling and, and, and reflecting is always going to be powerful. Um, I know personally, when I found myself in different leadership roles, I, I found an incredible amount of meaning and purpose through the personal growth that I have been able to see in myself and track over time, mm. um, that resilience that I've been able to see. And sometimes it's hard to see in the short term, you know, it, yeah. it's kind of like, you know, if you're, if you're like trying to lose weight, like you're exercising, you're trying to lose weight, like you're slowly building some muscle mass and you're losing some weight. Yeah. The day to day, you don't see it. Right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, you know, six months or a year down the road, you know, mm -hmm. you look in the mirror and you're like, oh, I lost 20 pounds and I put on some muscle, you know, and you look, you compare a picture from, you know, six months ago to six months down the road. And you're like, oh, that's actually quite a bit of difference. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of the same thing when you're like tracking yourself slowly over time as a leader, you may not notice uh, everything over time and in little increments. But if you... You know, so I'm a big advocate for not only reflecting consistently, but but take time to kind of do the meta reflections where you go yeah. back and look look at yourself and and track yourself um, over you know the months and even the years and see where you were and see where you've come um, because that can be super powerful um, and and quite invigorating. Uh, to realize like, oh, I've grown a lot as a person. I've grown a lot as a leader. Um, you might also cringe a bit. You might cringe when you realize, oh my gosh, I can't believe sure. I did that. I can't believe that's how I responded in that situation. But it also shows growth. It shows, you know, it shows your humanity. It shows your growth. It shows that, you know, you're you're on the right track. And, and that's a powerful motivator. That's a powerful thing. That's a powerful purpose. I have felt that. And I, and I think others can too. What you've articulated is resilience is really a muscle and resilience creates character development to your point, personal development. And as you know, character development happens when no one is looking. It's mm -hmm. the little things that make a difference every single day, or we could say a little becomes a lot over a long period of time. Well, Simon, this has just been a real pleasure. I know at the time I need to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. Uh, you can go to simontbailey.com in LinkedIn, uh, Simon T. Bailey. And I would just say wherever you are in the world right now, find somebody to care about them, uh, not for what you can get from them, but what you can give to them. And what you'll discover is the helper's high. There's research out of Emory <laughs> University that says when you help someone else, the reward centers in our brain begin to light up almost as if we have been on the receiving end of the person we've just helped. And John, they call it the helper's high. So if you want to be a leader, it. let's get high together. <laughs> I love it. One of the best highs you can have, right? Yes. Very good. Well, Simon, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Simon can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.